Welcome everybody out there to the Connect, Walter Anderson Museum of Arts, Arts and Culture Show, where we connect you with um, interesting people and topics and ideas from all over the map. So today, it's Earth Day, so happy Earth Day to everyone. It's the 50th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, of Earth Day, and so hopefully, even if you're inside right now, you're near a window, and maybe you'll take a nice walk later and appreciate where we are. So, of course, what we do each uh, episode, this is the third episode of The Connect, but we start with a Walter Anderson image and and ground our conversation in that. And Walter Anderson, for him, every day was Earth Day. The experiential nature of his work is such that the the Earth and and the environment really exists in the actual brush strokes and line work and colors that he he would put into his, his pieces. And... It's like Patty Carr Black, art historian, said, you know, he had a fundamental understanding of reality that that the, the earth and, and nature was connected, everything in the world, the interconnectedness of it, uh, the dynamism of, of matter, and that knowledge that we're participants in nature rather than just observers. And this, of course, a quote from Anderson, the, the artist knows that for him to be successful, art and nature must be one. So like I mentioned, this is... 50th anniversary of Earth Day, so five years after Anderson passed away in 1965 uh, was the first Earth Day in 1970, and here we are in 2020, uh, so many years ago, but some in many ways not removed from the same concerns and and reasons for that that celebration to have begun. Today we're going to be joined by an artist and um, an employee of the museum, our director of education, um, Anthony Defada, you're Tony. You're you're on the the screen now. So Tony's joining us from his his home studio, surrounded by art. How you doing over there on this Earth Day? I'm great. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> and I want to ask about that awesome hat. What's the deal with the bowler? Well, uh, actually, my my son uh, collects hats. He lo- and this bowler hat's his favorite. Um, but the reason I'm wearing it, I had a little bit of a a COVID. Uh, haircut um issue yesterday so and have you always um had that same haircut or what, what's your history with hair oh, i've i've gone through many different haircuts i don't think there's anything i haven't done maybe a mo- i don't think i've ever had a mohawk we're looking actually back at at a an archival image of you now and that's not john stamos hey. that is tony defada man those are some glorious rivulets flowing like the river themselves I wish I could see it. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. I don't wish I could see it. That's been scarred into everyone's memory right. in, in the best way possible. Great. Well, you're talking to a guy who'll dress up like a bear and climb a tree in downtown Ocean Springs. <laughs> well, I did want to ask you, you know, just as a human being on the planet, on planet Earth, what is your relationship to nature? Um, well, you know, I think it's growing up in the South, you're always going out in nature. Um, I grew up in um, South Louisiana, basically in the Honey Island Swamp, and so we were outdoors constantly. Um, my mom never had to tell us to get off the television. She had to yell at us to come inside when it was dark because we were spending all of our time outside running through the woods in the swamp and fishing. And um, So I've always had a connection to nature, and I think that wanting to pursue sue art and having a passion for art fits kind of hand in glove with being aware about the world around us. And I think a lot of artists um, end up being, um, you know, more socially aware and environmentally conscious than a lot of people. I think it's just kind of the, the way that we're wired. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I've noticed, I mean, you, your work is, is so varied and, and multifaceted, but you know, you had that cloud series that, that you've done, and we'll look at some other work you, you did. I've got one of the cloud images up here, too. Um, but it seems like you're, you, know, you, you vacillate between representation and graphic imagery, but also it seems like you pull from nature abstraction, which um, is definitely the case with clouds. So maybe as an artist, you know, you, we know what you, your upbringing in, in nature being from the South and, and all that we all experience being from here and especially here on the gulf coast being so close to nature but how has that relationship changed 
um, and evolved in your art practice. And specifically, you know, we're talking about Anderson too, so you can throw in any influences he might have had on you. But but how does that show up just as an artist in terms of dealing with the environment? Well, um, several years ago, I was asked to work on a fundraiser in um, Jackson, Mississippi. And um, Lori Smith got me involved. She's on the show Trading Spaces. And there was a lady that came down from Atlanta, uh, Jillian Pritchett, who's an interior decorator. And she actually designed uh, Ted Turner's daughter's home, Eco Manor. And it was one of the first completely cert- lead certified houses in um, America, for sure. And the idea was to create artwork and interior spaces and use materials that didn't um, gas off harmful um, chemicals. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it. I've always been concerned about the environment and what we do to the environment and put into it. But I'd never really considered what, as an artist what we go into our studios and are around. Um, this, the toxic solvents and some of the chemicals and pigments that are in the paints and the binders and things that we use. Um, I'd never really considered that. And she also um, was involved in getting VOC um, free paint um, made. And um, so I really started thinking about what, not just what I was, you know, trying not to put out into the environment, but what I was putting into my work. And then people were taking and putting it in their homes um, and so I s- set out to do a series of work where I didn't buy anything um, that I didn't already have except for some of my paints. I started using golden brand paints, not pitching it, but they're very environmentally conscious and they make paints that are um, not non-toxic. Um, I used things that I found, found objects. I used um, one great source, if you go to a frame shop, um, sometimes they'll reframe things for customers and just throw the old frames out. So I asked frame shop and Jackson if they would um, give me some of the old frames so I didn't have to create more stuff. I was reusing those. I used um, things I could find to paint on. Actually, this is the last piece from the show that I had in Atlanta, the last piece I have. And um, I took some old paintings that I had done, pieces of old things and studies, and I tore them up and I collaged them onto the surface. And um, I actually made about 20 of these, and they were hanging on the wall in a grid. And they're various widths because I just used wood that I found. We had some work done in our kitchen in Jackson. And so I, I always keep scrap woods, um, scrap wood, drives my wife crazy sometimes because I, I never like to throw anything away. Not only that, sometimes I'll stop and see something that someone else has um, taken out to the street and I'll throw it in the car and think I'll use it one day. But the actual surface that it's on is a piece of cork flooring that I found and just flipped it over and gessoed it. So this is, um, aside from the paint that I had in my studio, everything um, on this I found. What about as an educator? I mean, we, we do a lot of work at the museum and, and have over the past many, many years, whether it's beach cleanups with, with partners in, in conservation or you know science programs where we're talking about the watershed and ecology. Um, but then as a teaching artist, you know, the, especially with using found materials, I know you've been keen on doing a lot of that, especially since we had a summer artist residency last year with, with Lonnie Holly, who's a, a celebrated artist in collections all over the world. And, um, you know, wh- how has that influenced your work? Seeing, seeing Lonnie Holly come down here, I guess, for one, and then, um, just in teaching other people and, and students and young people about, about what it means to make art and do it in, in concert with the environment. I did that with the kids at the summer camps. One of the, one of the projects we did for the 3d camps, was we went around and we collected sticks and leaves and things. And um, we were also a, a lady that was part of the Ocean Springs Art Association passed away and her family donated a bunch of the uh, art supplies and um, little craft 
crafting supplies that she had. So we put those to good use and um, just tied ribbons around things and took basically sticks and you know tied things to them, ribbon, um, yarn. We glued things to them, buttons, and just you know made these really neat things. And then we hung them around uh, the front porch of the cottage, and they were really neat. I, I love them till somebody said it reminded them of the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> well, it was a, an amazing time. We, this Lonnie Holly residency I was mentioning that was working with students across the coast, uh, many of whom came from Eastern Jackson County, and they they were sourcing material from Horn Island. We went out there and, and found pieces, uh, both organic and inorganic material. And then also from even your garage, we, we sourced some things from there, old records and uh, we found a, a door, uh, some other pieces of of sculptural frameworks that then they built atop. Um, and then it, be- it became a really nuanced conversation. And I think that was what Lonnie was trying to in- impart to the students. Um, but really what we all should think about is that nature has its own story and identity just in the things that grow and that live, but also in the things that we discard and that go into nature um, that can sometimes be a, a negative story in terms of pollution, but also if we're able to reclaim and reuse some of those things that, um, you know, there's hope to, to have a conversation about that and, and hopefully do do things that move us in a, in a good direction there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, um, what, what would you say to people who are maybe at home even today and, you know, in the present moment about what, what kind of things they can use to uh, to make work. I know we're going to do a demo in a minute, but just in general, right. how do you approach objects, and how would you tell people that they should think of, think differently about the things that are just laying around? Well, for one thing, I um I think, and it's doing this over a period of time. I've kind of almost trained myself to that everything I look at, whether it's an object in my house or something I see on the street or a scene, um, you know, a landscape it immediately pops into my head. How can I make that art or how can I make art from it or art with it? And so it just kind of becomes a way of thinking. And right now, you know, more so than ever, because it's a lot harder to get out and, and, and go to the art supply store. And, um, you know, a lot of people might not be able to, uh, afford to order things online, even because of, you know, be people being, put out of work so you can find things around the house. I just kind of went into my recycling bin. If you don't have, you know, paper or something, you can take cardboard and, you know, a cardboard box and, and use this as a surface to paint on. Um, I, I did a, we did a video of me doing a, uh, a foam print demonstration at the museum and that's on our art plus page, but you can also save like meat, the old meat, uh, trays and just kind of cut the edges off of them draw with a pencil in here your design and if you don't have ink or watercolor paint you can use um uh, food coloring and use that as your ink i know this might not make sense but um check out the video we did on that it's a really easy fun way to create um prints i also before i throw magazines out into the recycling bin I'll flip through and keep a stack of pieces that I find interesting, um, images that I find interesting, and hold on to them. And then when I'm deciding I want to work on a collage, I'll have a little library of images I can go through, cut them out, uh, glue them together, and make images. Sometimes I paint on top of them. Um, so, oh, this, this is this, this. I started this one. Um, a little sculpture because this is kind of, I think, timely. Uh, I'm going to continue to work on this and see what happens and build it up as we uh, get more toilet paper rolls. That just reminded me I better get this little piece off of here before I incorporate it into the yeah, that. that's like working sure. with with like gilded lilies or, or gold. I mean, that's a that's that's a material that is hard to come by. Right, and um, I mean, there's just once you really start, if you say you don't have anything that you can work with around the house, um, you're not looking. This is just something I cut this piece off an old paper bag. Um, if you go to the frame shop, sometimes they'll give you, um, when they cut the inside of a mat out, 
Um, this mat board is great to use as a surface. Um, I save pieces of wood when we have stuff done around the house and use it. So um, you really, once you start looking, you'll see that you've got a wealth of materials to make art with. I mean, it really kind of goes back to some of the things that Lonnie said about, you know, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure, that sort of thing. So um, on the demo front, what, what do you want to show us today? Okay, so a um, couple things I wanted to mention first. So uh, this is a really great book that I use as a resource. Uh, can you see it? Green Guide for Artists. And it's by uh, Kristen Hampshire. And this has some really great craft and arts ideas, but it also talks about the chemicals that are used in um, art materials that you want to try to avoid. And again, Golden is a Golden is a good responsible company. They're cheap. They're not cheap, but they're they're good. Um, so what we're going to do is I always save wrapping paper and tissue paper that comes in presents, like Christmas presents, birthday presents, whatever. And you can use them. You can use it for tons of different things. This is something that we did in uh, summer camp in our 3D camp. This is just um, a piece of the blue foam that's used on um, insulation for houses and some uh, pipe cleaners. You can use anything. This, you can find some old wire. I think I found this laying in my yard. And make your shape, and then you can take this, uh, this tissue, colored tissue paper. And it's kind of tricky. You have to start with the base first. But you mi use a mixture of glue, just regular Elmer's glue. If you don't have that, you can use water and um, and, um, and flour. And you just kind of build it up slowly. And you can create these little sculptures. And you already have the base because you had to put the wire in there. Um, these are a lot of fun. It takes a little while. That's you great. can also use the 2D art, um, which I've kind of got ready to demonstrate. Can you see this? Do I need to move this up a little bit? We can see pretty good, but whatever whatever you think. So this is super easy. So I've, what I've done is I've got a mixture of about 50-50 of water and Elmer's glue. And um, I've taken some of the tissue and cut, uh, just tore it up into pieces. And what you want to do is – well, this is leaning funny. First of all, you paint some of this mixture. You need you need to thin it out because it needs to soak all the way through the tissue. And you just paint some on your surface where you're going to stick your tissue and just plop it on there and then get a little bit more on your brush. You don't have to have it sopping wet. And then you just kind of smooth it out and make sure that the whole surface is covered with the uh, the glue and water mixture. And then you just continue to add to it. I'm not going to fill this whole page up or anything, but I've done a lot of paintings this way. Now, over time, the, uh, the paper is going to fade. So what I started doing is painting once I kind of figured out my composition with the tissue – and, it's, and, it, and it forces you to be kind of random, and I like that. Um, as you mentioned before, I do a lot of different types of work. I think it's just because of ADD, I get bored. Um, but I've learned that when I sort of get tired of something, say I get tired of doing landscape or abstract or figurative, uh, I'll go work on something else like still life until I'm not growing and it gets boring to me. And so I'll kind of loop back around. And every time I loop back around, say I haven't done any portraits in a while, and I've been doing abstract or something else, then um, it kind of – I see it with a fresh eye, and it, it, helps, it helps the work to evolve because I do get bored really easily. But you could fill the whole page up. Um, you could decide to use a limited palette. Um, I like to use – analogous colors which are colors that are close together on the color wheel and then like say blue green and purple 
and then maybe use a little bit of the blues um, complementary color, which is orange, and that kind of makes it pop. And when so, you once you have um, you know a, a ground of those, we, we, do you go back and potentially paint on top, or what would you say, people? I, I know there's no rules, but do you use paint on top of that? Almost, almost always, and then most of the time with these that's not the final thing i'll i'll have a stack of these on on just like some paper or, and um i'll i'll tear them up and then incorporate it in, in, into another piece a larger piece uh so the piece behind the easel you can take this off now i don't know if you can see that that piece the kind of octopus looking guy with the eyeball that piece has a lot of um collage pieces from other paintings that i've done and and the other one that i showed does as well the piece up here up high is actually um ellen langford who's a, a, a wonderful friend and a, an amazing artist did a workshop last year that i got to participate in the second day and all the tables were covered in just this kind of newsprint paper. And at the end of the day, I still had paint in my tray. And I hate, like I said, I hate wasting stuff. And so I just took the leftover paints and I'd already, you know, tested colors and things and mixed. So there was already paint on the table. But without even really thinking about what I was doing, I took the rest of the paint that I had instead of dumping it down the sink, which is terrible. You, sh you shouldn't do that. Um, I just uh, painted and kind of let it happen, and I actually like it. Uh, now I wish it was on better paper, but I'm glad that that's you know, how it happened. Sometimes when you use paper materials, it uh, makes you less self-conscious because you're not worried about you know screwing up a good canvas with some good paint, and it it kind of takes the pressure off, so you're able to do um, better work. Yeah, I mean, you know, and the the cool thing about Walter Anderson, if we think about the materials he was using, these are these humble materials, typing paper in many cases. Um, obviously, he had his sketchbooks and just pen and ink or a pencil, and, and you're able to create these works that then live on in museums. Now, like you said, some, some things aren't archival, and then uh, curators or registrars and collections people have to figure out what to do with them. But for, for most of us, we don't need to, to, to make work with with that in mind, I think it's more important to, to create some things. And I remember you telling me about a, a program you led in Jackson in the homeless community where you were using um, initially, I think, canvases and there was some trepidation on the part of some of the artists. But once you started using right. cardboard as the canvas, that it unlocked a little bit of creativity because the stakes weren't as high. And it's just that little mental switch that, that you can you can turn on. Right, we just walked behind that. He he was nervous when I brought paint and canvas because he'd just recently gotten out of prison and he had did some fantastic drawing, but he'd never painted. And I said, well, let's paint on something that you're not going to be so worried about. So we walked around behind the little homeless day shelter where I was uh, doing these classes a couple times a week and just started grabbing pieces of cardboard. And I'd never done many portraits until then, so it, it forced me to get outside of my comfort zone. And we kind of learned how to paint portraits together and it started a whole new series in fact i've got one of them right here this is one of the portraits we would you know give somebody a couple of bucks or something and have another one of the homeless people sit for us and we ended up doing a whole series of these and had a show together at, at the uh, eudora welty library that's great that's beautiful well, um, I know we wanted to mention a few things before we, we conclude about how people can can find some of these instructionals that, that you've mentioned um, before. So tell us a bit about Art Plus and, and also the, uh, the digital senior scholarship show that we've got coming up. Right. We, um, there's a page on our, our website called Art Plus, and we've been creating content to that, videos. We're going to be doing virtual tours. We've got some things that we're going to be posting, lesson plans, things that uh, we're, I'm working with a, a few teachers to rewrite lesson plans that connect art um, using Walter Anderson's life and work as a vehicle 
to other things such as science, um, language arts, mathematics, and that's why we're calling it Art Plus. It'll be connected to the museum, but we're rewriting and writing lesson plans that, uh, because so many people, you know, are out of school right now, that a parent or a student could easily administer these lesson plans by themselves without having to have a, a degree in education. Um, we're also uh, still going forward with our senior scholarship um, exhibition. There's just a few more days to apply for it, but you can go to our website and it's for seniors that are current seniors in high school. They'll have to submit a, a piece of artwork that they've done within the last year and write a short essay on how it connects um, to the life or the work of Walter Anderson. And um, it's two scholarships. The money uh, will be paid directly to the school once you register at the school. And it doesn't matter if you are or are not an art major. Um, if you win one of the scholarships, it will go straight to the uh, school regardless of if you're an art major or not. Yeah, that's a great program. And um, the scholarship fund created by Linda Rossetti has made this possible. And, and like Tony said, you know, these are students from all different fields of study who are going into college and then, you know, influenced by Walter Anderson is a very open-ended um, term. It can be anything about nature and art. It just inf in invites them to, to learn a bit about Walter Anderson so that they can, um, can you know, connect their, their work to his. And Walter Anderson wrote and lived and created about everything under the sun. So you can, you could make pretty much anything fit within that parameter but we've got some wonderful work in usually it's a physical show at the museum but this year this will be all digital and, and juried and um, just a great a great way to to get some some young adults uh, a little bit of uh, momentum going into college and and hopefully continuing to create whether that's something that they do professionally or not because so many of the artists um, we're all artists in some capacity you don't have to to do it as a career um, but Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Um, anything else you want to say to people on Earth Day or, or to recap anything um, that you think they should keep in mind from, from our talk today? Um, one of the things that we talked about in, our, in the pilot program that we did with um, uh, USM and um, uh, MEC is that everything's connected. So what we, what we do to the environment we're doing to ourselves. So the, the, the things that we put into our water, we're going to eventually end up drinking that or eating fish that was in that. So I would just um, call people to uh, be mindful of things and think of it as not just what we're doing to our beautiful environment, but we're, we're doing it to ourselves and to our children. If everybody tries just does something small, it, it will make a big difference. Um, that's that's, that's, that's it, excellent. though. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Well, thanks again, Tony. Um, we're going to sign off, and um, you can go ahead and wave to, to the to the people out there and tell them bye. And, uh, bye. But uh, stick with us as we sign off here. And what we're going to do, um, I'm going to give the last word, actually, to Lonnie Holly and some of the students who we collaborated with last summer uh, this is just a little clip that that has has them repeating the mantra of of Lonnie Holly, the artist, which is thumbs up for for Mother Universe. So uh, y'all join in us, uh, please join us next time on the Connect. Thank you for being with us today, and uh, we'll be announcing the next episode uh, coming up soon. We've got a wonderful growing slate of guests, and we look forward to continuing to do this. So y'all have a wonderful Earth Day, and we're going to turn it over to Lonnie Holly. I said, come on, join me. Let's take care of this space. Then that's my space for us, okay? Okay, guys? Yes, sir. And I thank you all very much for being a part of my space for it. Thumbs up, Mother Universe. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. For Mother Universe. For Mother Universe. Thumbs up. For the Mother Universe. Thumbs up for Mother Universe.